It can be a bit confusing for beginners to work with nodes, but once we understand how they work, we can use them to our advantage to create great materials and turn our models from looking like this to this. This will be an overview for the most commonly used nodes in Blender, but if you wish to read about any node in detail, I'll put a link for Blender documentation in the description. So what actually is a node? A node is basically an operation. It takes some inputs, processes them, and outputs the result. For example, a math node set to add will take either these two values or whatever we input in them, add them together and output the resulting value. A node has different types of inputs depending on its function. There are four types of inputs. A float input which is any decimal value, a vector input which is a set of three float values, then we have a color input which is also a set of three float values, but then what's the difference between color and vector? The only difference between color and vector is that vectors are represented as x, y, and z axis, and the color is represented as r, g, and b channels. Apart from this difference, they are essentially the same and can be used interchangeably. For example, if we take this RGB node and in the red channel, we set the value to one, the result will be a red color. And if we take a vector node, and set the value for x-axis as 1, we will get the same result. Then we have the shader input, which is different from the other three inputs, because it does not carry any value. Instead, it carries the information about the surface of our object and cannot be used interchangeably. When we create a new material, we get a principal BSTF node, which is a shader node, and a material output node. Shader node contains all the information about the surface of our object. The material output node tells the render engine what to calculate. Only the nodes connected to this node will be evaluated at the time of render. Instead of inputting values directly in the shader node, we usually create a setup like this, where we connect all our image texture nodes to the shader node and control the mapping using a mapping and a texture coordinate node. Now that we understand the basic workflow of creating a material, let's take a look at some nodes we can use to create or import textures. First we have the image texture node. We can use it to import our textures. If we click on this icon, we can browse through the images available in the scene, or we can create a new image of any resolution. We can choose a color to fill the image, or we can generate a UV or a color grid. We can make it full float and enable tiling. We can also import textures from our hard drive. If you notice, we have this new icon here. It shows us how many nodes are using this image. If you press Shift D to duplicate this node, this number changes to 3. Then we have the shield icon, because by default, if an image is not connected to any node, it will be deleted next time you launch Blender. To prevent that, you can click on this icon to create a fake user. We can unlink an image from here. We have some options down here. First, interpolation type, which means what kind of filter you want to apply when you scale up or down the image. Linear is regular quality. Closest is no or minimal filtering, cubic will make your images smoother, and smart will auto-select cubic when scaling up and linear when scaling down, although it only works with cycles. Then we have projection type. When using seamless or tileable textures, you want to select one that works best for your geometry. Then we have extension options for how we want our image to extend. Then we have source type. Depending on what we want to import, Blender auto-detects it when you import something, but you may want to cross-check when you are using UDIMS. Next, we have color space. As a rule of thumb, you want to select sRGB for any texture that is contributing to the color of the surface and non-color for any other texture. After that, we have alpha options. Straight means no processing. Pre-multiplied means RGB and alpha channel are multiplied together. Choose channel pack when you have different images in each channel and none will basically trash your alpha and fill it with white. If you control shift and left click on any node, we can view it in the viewport. If you control shift and left click again, we can cycle through the outputs of the node. But for this shortcut to work, you must have node wrangler add-on enabled. You can enable it by going into the preferences, add-on tab, and search for node wrangler add-on and turn it on. Then we have our multi-purpose noise texture node. We can adjust the scale of the noise, increase the detail or roughness. We can adjust the luminarity which is basically the gap between each octave, and we can also add some distortion. Normalize button will fit the noise range between 0 and 1. We have some dimension options here. 1D will fill the object with one color, and we can use this value to animate the noise. 2D will generate a 2D noise on X and Y axis. 3D will generate a 3D noise, and 4D is similar to 3D, except we have this new value here, which we can use to animate the noise. With the black and white output, we also have a color output. Next, we have a Voronoi texture. This node has just so many possibilities. We have the same dimension options here. Then we have feature output. Each one will give you a different type of result. 
Then we have distance matrix. You can play with these settings to create hundreds of textures. We have the same settings as noise texture, except this one. This randomized value will control the randomization of the cells. If we go into the color mode, we can see it more clearly. And we also have a position output for each cell. Want to create a brick wall? We have a node that does just that. We can adjust the offset of the rows and change the frequency of the offset. Now every third row is being offset. We can also squash or stretch the rows and adjust the frequency of the squash. We can set any color for the bricks and the mortar between the bricks. We can adjust the scale, mortar size and the softness. Bias will allow you to have more bricks of one color or another. And finally, we can adjust the width and the height of the bricks. Then we have the checker texture node. We can change the color from here and adjust the scale. This also gives you a black and white mask. Now let's create some waves. We can either choose to create bands or rings and the axis on which we want them and we can select different types of profiles. From here we can increase or reduce the scale, add some distortion to create wood-like texture, we can add detail, adjust the scale of the detail and the roughness and face will simply slide these waves to one side or another. Next we have a gradient texture node. We can select any type of gradient we want to create. Next we have a magic texture. It gives us this strange texture. You can increase the depth, which is basically the level of detail. But the higher this value is, the more time it will take to render. You can increase the scale and distortion. And it also gives us the alpha. Input nodes can be very useful. Let's look at some of them. A texture coordinate node allows us to access different kinds of coordinates. You want to use generated when your object doesn't have UVs and it is also great for deforming geometry because the texture always sticks to the surface of the geometry. Then we have normal coordinates. This is basically the direction each face is facing. We can use it to create cool effects like this. You want to select UV coordinates when you have created a texture based on the UVs of your object. This is basically what we choose when we import image textures. Next we have object coordinates. They are pretty similar to generated coordinates, except they don't stick to the surface. You can see this example. Then we have camera coordinates, which is the coordinates from the camera's point of view. Window coordinates will attach the texture to this window, and your object will act, well, as a window. And finally we have reflection coordinates. We can use this to map an image as reflections. We can attach a different object to this texture coordinate node. If we create an empty object and select it here, now if you move that object, you can see the texture will move with it. For this to work, you need to have object coordinate selected. We have another great node, which is the geometry node. It allows us to access information about our geometry, like the position of our geometry and the normals. These normals are different from the normals in texture coordinate node. Texture coordinate node provides the object space normals and the geometry node provides the world space normals. Two normals will allow you to have the flat face normal of the object, even if you have smooth shading on. Then we have pointiness. It only works with cycles. If we add a color ramp here and push the blacks closer to white, you can see it more clearly. It is giving us the pointy areas of the object. A random per island will assign a random value to each loose part or island of a geometry. We can use a color ramp node to randomize the colors. RGB node will allow you to create one simple color. Similar to this, we have a value node, which will allow you to create one float value. Then we have an ambient occlusion node. You have to turn on ambient occlusion in EV for this to work. In cycles, it works by default. You can increase or reduce the distance and you can increase the sample for better quality. If you turn on inside, it will calculate the ambient occlusion from the inside, giving you a result like this. A Fresnel node will give you this kind of result. It will always be white near the edges, no matter from where you look at it, because this effect is based on point of view. 
You can adjust the IOR to increase or reduce the edge. You can use a wireframe node if you want to render a wireframe of your geometry. We've covered so many useful nodes in such a short time. Let's continue with the remaining categories in the next part of this video. So, I'll see you there.